Okay. okay. All the audience members get back with that. We're ready to go. Okay, we're happy to have Alexei Yaznikov at the Naval Academy again. And he's going to speak on non commutative discrete optimization. Thank you very much, Tony. It's nice to be here and given a talk and have all informal talks around with you. It's even more pleasure. Um, so I will talk about non-commutative discrete optimization. It's a new thing and uh, it's a combination of um, group theory and uh, classical complexity theory, I guess. So the little plan is I will discuss uh, how to generalize the standard discrete optimization problem to non-commutative uh, groups and uh, we'll mostly focus on knapsack type problems and groups and some open problems and try to explain why it's interesting um, so basically what what I will try to do I will I claim that almost all standard problems from uh, classical combinatorial optimization, you can take them and naturally generalize to non-commutative case. And not just it's uh, generalizable, it's interesting from algebraic viewpoint and also it's interesting from complexity viewpoint. Because it brings uh, really some new uh, stuff into uh, the complexity of this problem. So, some examples. There are many types of uh, classical uh, combinatorial optimization problems. Some of them concern with integers, for example, subset sum, knapsack, and quite, quite a few others. So what's the classical subset sum problem? Given integers or positive integers, doesn't matter, there are variations which are equivalent in the classical case. So given integers a1, a k, and a, uh, one has to decide whether some linear combination of these integers where coefficients are zeros or ones is equal to given a. So in other words, you, you are missing some elements in the given set and sum up. That's why it will subset some problem. It's known to be hard uh, in the classical case. It means it's NP-complete. What I will be talking about, it's, uh, in the classical case, it's about complexity. Everything is decidable. Of course, you can check all possible combinations and sum them up and see whether it's equal to A or not. But it's a brute force. It's exponentially many choices to, to consider. But on the other hand, it, it's uh, p-timed by non-deterministic machine because if you are given particular tuple of coefficients, you can check in polynomial time whether it's true or not. So non-deterministically, it's, uh, it's easy, it's polynomial time. So what is corresponding subset sum, or I would in this case say sub-product maybe problem subset product problem in G, still subset sum, we call it. Take elements G1, GK, and G in G, and decide whether this product is equal to G. The only thing here, we should be careful that we take elements in the given order, because the group might not be commutative. Otherwise, everything is the same. So what, what I was doing, uh, instead of integers, which for me is just infinite cyclic group. I go to arbitrary group and formulate the, th the same problem. And here elements are given as words in a fixed set of generators. That's a standard way in group theory to represent elements. So nothing, nothing really, uh, really new. It's just the same problem for arbitrary group instead of infinite cyclic one. So how about other problems? So you have to know how the, the word problem has to be solved, right? Yeah, you can ask uh, 
this problem, if, if the real problem is, is not solvable, uh, they, this problem is not decidable too. So uh, always, I will always assume that the real problem is decidable, because otherwise it's not very interesting. Anyway, so the classical lattice problems are about integer lattices in the in Zn or Qn. So what are integer lattices from abstract algebra viewpoint? They are just subgroups of these groups, really. So what you can do now, you can, so what the, for example, the shortest vector problem, the classical hard problem, find the shortest vectors in a given lattice of Zn or Qn. You are given a lattice by some generation set, and you are, you are asked to find the shortest vector there. And it's known to be NP-complete again. NP-complete, it means the hardest among all NP problems. So for a group G now, what, what is required, you're given a group G and finitely many elements. And the equation is to find a shortest element in the given subgroup generated by this element. Shortest, it means in the word metric. So every element is represented by some word in the generators. And the shortest word is the length of the element. So now you would like to find shortest element in this in the subgroup generated by a given element. That's precisely the generalization when instead of Zn or Qn, I am taking arbitrary group G. Again, it's just from algebraic viewpoint, I just replaced one group by another, didn't change anything. And that's very interesting problem in algebra, finding a shortest element in the subgroup. There are several very interesting, famous problems in combinatorial discrete optimization, uh, which are uh, for graphs. For example, traveling salesman problem, or Steiner tree problem, or the Hamiltonian circuit problem. So they are formulated for arbitrary finite graphs. Instead of arbitrary finite graphs, you can do the following. You you, you pick your favorite group, infinite group. Consider it's scaly graph. So it's a, you take a, a group generated by a finite set and take its scaly graph, what the scaly graph is. It's a, it's a graph where vertices are precisely elements and two elements are connected by an edge labeled by one of the generators if h, this vertex, is equal to g to x times x. So this is a geometric object which, which tells a lot about the group. So it, it contains all the inform geometric information about the, the group in, in some sense. So what's going on, and it's very natural reformulation, you fixed infinite graph, and now if you have finitely many vertices, given finitely many vertices, you, you need to find a closed tour of minimal total lengths in the, in the metric of the graph that visits all the vertices once. So you have infinite graph as input, an input for your problem, you are given finitely many vertices, V1, Vn, and you need to go around somehow visiting once and the total length of the tour should be minimal. So what's the difference? Instead of all finite graphs, I consider graphs inside one particular Kelly graph. In other words, I put some bounds on the geometry of finite graphs, which are, I just consider graphs which are embeddable in there, for the complete subgraphs. For example, if you take a free group, and the Cayley graph of a free group is just a tree, which is planar, 
if you are given vertices, you can go around in one particular direction, say, around in clockwise. And when you go around, that's the shortest one. It's easy. For three groups, it's, this problem is easy, easily in polynomial time. Of course, it's exponential time. It's always true, because you just try one by one all possible combinations all possible tours, but uh, for free group, it's, it's, you, can, you can see immediately it's very easy in polynomial time. But for example, for hyperbole groups, which are symptotically like free groups, this whether traveling salesman problem in a given hyperbole group is decidable in polynomial time or not is very interesting open problem and a lot of algorithmic problems about hyperbolic groups they related to this one so what I'm saying is this geometry uh, allows one sometimes to solve it quickly traveling assessment problem and sometimes it's not easy for example for hyperbolic groups we don't know and there are groups where it's hard Um, so you can, I claim that you can go in the almost all problems you can generalize to the non-commutative situation. Um, so all the all the one of the classical ones that that, that I mentioned they are NP complete. But complex, complexity, time complexity, the time complexity of their non-commutative analogs is not clear. It depends on the group, and it's quite interesting. I will show some examples. So uh, when we started this, uh, the idea was that we bring these problems to group theory. In the classical combinator uh, combinatorics, they are important, we know, because a lot of problems can be reduced to them. And we thought that it will be a good class of um, algorithmic problems in groups, that if you understand their nature, we can have some kind of collection of problems such that all others can be reduced to them. So the complexity theory uh, became kind of theory, really, when people realized uh, or discovered quite a lot of uh, NP-complete problems. Now, if you are given a problem from classical com combinatorial optimization, Specialists can easily reduce to one of them and say, okay, this is one is also NP-complete because it, some others can be reduced to this one. So it's, it's very robust theory because there is a good atlas. In, in algebra, nothing like that is known. So idea was, let's do the analogs and we will have some good tools. What unexpectedly came out, it's, uh, it turns out that the complexity of these problems the classical ones. What we know about them is just one particular viewpoint. There is much, much more deeper reasons why they are sometimes hard, sometimes not hard. So it sheds some light really on uh, on the classical problems. And uh, when you talk to real uh, specialists and combinatorial optimization, usually they say, so why bother for non-commutative ones? We, we need these ones. What they need, they need good algorithms, not the theory about NP-complete problems. NP-complete problems is the theory of NP-completeness is as abstract as non-commutative group theory. So actually no relations to uh, practical problems. I don't know. Uh, Anyway, so what I would like to talk about, about three types of problems, so-called knapsack type problems in different groups and show how, it, how different it is for several, for various groups and what, what's in, why it's interesting. The classical subset sum problem, one of the few initial anti-complete problems and then it became famous after Merkel Hellman crypto system proposed on, 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 on this related to this problem. 
it was broken by Shamir, but people reinvented in different guises and tried still because it's a really good idea. Anyway, so what is knapsack problem in group? Given group G and tuple of elements G1, GK, and G, decide whether G is equal to the product, but coefficients now not zero ones, but arbitrary integers. So it's knapsack, you can you can fill in your knapsack with putting as many of G1s as you want. There are very, uh, variations, we don't care about them. They, in the classical case, they are all reducible to each other. In the non-commutative, it's, mu it's much harder, but I don't want to, to think about this. This will be the classical one. And subset sum is just 0, 1 knapsack. It's related, knapsack is related to many equations in group theory. Just people didn't realize that it's knapsack there. It was, it, it occurred in, in different sort of disguises again. For it's Gilbert, is it Gilbert Bounce? Yeah, it's Gilbert Bounce Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it was used in equations in groups, algebraic geometry, completions. And it's routine and hyperbolic group, but they call it quite the geodesics because it's geometric from geometric viewpoint. Anyway, another one which I think extremely interesting, it's subanoid membership problem. So what what does it mean? Given a finite set and element G, given element G1, GK and element G of G, decide if G belongs to the submanoid generated by A. In other words, if G is a product of these elements in some order or not. If I here duplicate every GI by its inverse, for example, G1, G1 inverse, G2, G2 inverse, so, and so on, submanoid generated by this element will be actually the subgroup. So it's, it contains a subgroup membership problem, which is classical in algebra, but you can, you can have submanoid. It, it makes sense. Actually. So I would like to talk about uh, complexity of algorithms. So to estimate complexity, you need to be able to compare number of steps of your algorithm, how long it works, uh, compared to the size of the initial input. So you allow, say, quadratically many steps with respect to the size of the input. If you read a word of length 10 million, you, you allow, say, 10 million square steps. So you need to know how what the size of your input. Typically, it's not very difficult. Uh, if x is finite, then every element in the group, x is a generated, generated set. So every element represented by a word, and the length of the word, we know it. That's the length of the word. In, in if, for example, if you represent numbers in binaries, the length of the word, that's the length of the word. The, that's the size of the number. If you have tuple of words, you can consider the total length. In other words, size is as much sort of space you need to write it up. The word, you write the word, that's length of the word. You, you, wrote down several words total length. Everything is obvious when x is finite, but when x is not finite, it's not that obvious. For example, let uh, x1, for example, x is generated by x1, x2, and so on. So for example, you have x and the index. So you can think about the size of x, the size of the index, but you can do other things. In any case, what's going on we assume that every letter is encoded by some binary string. That's standard, so com completely standard assumption in computer science. But in any case, you, you represent your x, elements in x, by some words, and then size of x is the length of the word. Size of the tuple is sum of the sizes of its components. 
So the only difference is, for example, a letter, letters, they have different sizes. And it's natural because you have to differentiate them. X, X100, it, it, it's not just text, it's also 100 there, somehow written. There are variations. If you bound the exponents, you have bounded maps. It's not very interesting because it's p time equivalent to subset sum. If I return a little bit, submonoid problem is like that. If the if elements commute, it will be just first element and some power times the second and some power and so on. So what I'm trying to say that in the classical case, submonoid and knapsack is the same thing. When you go to non-commutative, it branches and it, the complexity becomes different, really. Quite interesting. Uh, this problem is very interesting again. So you would, you're, you're given elements, G1, GK, and G, and you would like to know whether G belongs to the submonoid generated by these elements. But the product must be of bounded size. So input is as before, and, and the bound, which is given in as in unary, so-called. If m is 2, it will be 1, 1. If m is 100, it will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 100 times. I will explain why. But. So the point is, if I don't put any restriction at, on the number of factors here, the problem might be undecidable. We don't know. It's something that many tries to do, to check. But if it's bounded, it's not just exponentially many. So if the real problem is decidable, we have the, the algorithm. It just may be long. In effect, if it's brute force, basically. So this is a computer science way to to go from undecidable to decidable, and the question is how fast we can go. Polynomial or exponential, or it's NP complete, something like this. So it's, it becomes about complexity. I'm sorry, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not getting to any results yet. I'm just trying to discuss a little bit of uh, of variations. So what, what I was talking about, it was decision, so-called decision type problems. The question was always, is it true that this solution is decidable, the equation is decidable or not? So answer is yes or no. Now I would like to do slightly different. If there is a solution, I would like to find it. So it's a different, it's search variation. Find the solution. And, and there is, in the combinatorial for discrete optimization theory, problems are not just decision or search, but they are optimization problems, really. I I'm getting to it. So how to do this optimization in non-commutative groups? It's not obvious. For example, what does it mean? You, you have to find some particular solution to your equation, say, or to your, to your problem, under some optimal restriction, for example, Solve knapsack optimization problems. It means solve this equation as usual for knapsack with the minimal possible number of factors. So optimization condition is minimize the number of factors. You, you, you may say, why is this? But if you go to geometric group theory, you have a subgroup and decompose your element as a minimal product of the generators of in the subgroup. It means you'll find it a geodesics in the subgroup, which is a really important question in geometric group theory. So it makes sense. Uh, you go into a subgroup, decompose G as a product of the generators of the subgroup. You would like to have minimal because it's a geodesic inside the subgroup. But it's not what the classical knapsack optimization problem is still. It, it, uh, if you go to the books, it's different. So what, what's the classical one? The classical one is actually given again these things, 
you, you don't want to find a precise, a precise solution. You would like to, to fill in your knapsack as much as possible. So the question is, find such coefficient that the total sum will be as close to A as possible, less but close to the maximum one. And you have already inequality. Now if you would think how to generalize to groups, there are no inequality in groups. In integers we can compare numbers, in groups we can't. Uh, sometimes we can, but maybe not natural. So that's the main question. So what you can do, given elements G and H in U and U in G, with, we say that U belongs to the segment between G and H. If there is a geodesic path in the Cayley graph from G to H that contains U. So we, we, we would like to, to bring geometry here. So this is your Cayley graph, like that. And you have two elements, G and H. And, and there are shortest paths in the graph. Every H is, is counted as distance one. So, so there are, there are paths which are minimal in this metric. It's, it's a indeed metric. But there are many of them actually. Could be actually exponentially many. Uh, so u is less than g, sorry, more than g, less than h, if u belongs to one of the geodesics inside. So that's a, that's a natural generalization actually, because if you take integers, as I said, for me it's just infinite cyclic group generated, say, by one element, one. So what does it mean u is between 0 and 10? There is only one geodesic straight line, straight segment. So it's, it's precisely this thing for infinite cyclic group. So I, I say that it's very, very natural generalization. So the optimization problem will be Given the elements as before, find coefficients such that this product belongs to the segment from 1 to g. So you fill in this knapsack, and the, it's the best possible in the metric of the Cayley graph. So, and you can generalize this to all other optimization problems like that. So what I'm saying is that all of them can be naturally generalized to groups. Let's see what you will get, what kind of results you get. So I spent quite a lot of time, though it's still 2 o'clock. But on, on some uh, the dictionary between the classical and non commutative Now I would like to, to show that um, there is much more stuff in non-commutative case that you can cannot see in the classical situation. So let's 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 have a look at the classical subset sum problem. I said it is NP complete. What does it mean? It means that the numbers A1, AN and A are assumed to be given in binaries. And in this case, it's NP, and it's NP complete, the hardest in the class NP. But if you give them in unaries, the problem becomes obviously polynomial, easy. So when you ask a mathematician with classical mathematical education, what was the natural number, say zero, people say it's an ordinal empty set, and one is the set which contains empties, I don't know. If you, if you go through set theory, you will say something like that. Or maybe if you, if you read logic books, they say five, it's one, 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 five times. So people think about numbers in unaries. And then it's very easy. But in binaries, it's different. And in, in classical uh, complexity theory, they call it there is a pseudo-polynomial algorithm. It means when numbers are given in unaries, it's polynomial. Okay. And 
it, it's again, it, it looks already a problem how we, how we can see this difference in non-commutative groups. Let's see, it's, it's actually very easy. If Z is generated by one, then, as I said, group formulation of SSP for this group is the same as the classical one, in which numbers are given in unity, because when I have generator one, number two will be for me one plus one, number three will be one plus one plus one. So it's unity. To, to write number 100, I need to, to put 100 times 1 plus 1 plus 1. So in this case, subset sub problem for this group with respect to this finite generated set is polynomial time. But if you do differently, if C for you is generated by this infinite generating set, Xn is 2 to the n. And encoding, encoding, so it's infinite set of generators, and Xn is 2 to the n, and it's natural to assume that the size is precisely how much I need to write it down. I need two one symbol, but also n. So size is about n. You can even write it down formally, but we don't care. So, so it's 2 to the n, it's... Uh, size of it, it's n of this generator. Then, given natural number, given integer, you can decompose with respect to this set of generators. How you decompose? You took the highest power of 2 to the n, which is not higher than this one, put coefficient 1, and go on, so you'll get the binary decomposition. And then, of course, in this case, it will be the classical problem is when numbers are given in binary, so it's NP complete. So what I'm trying to say, you don't need to, to do to know this unaries of binaries. You go to different generating sets, and you will see it automatically. All finite sets are equivalent, and uh, for infinite it depends. In this case, that's a difference. So even the simplest case, Z, infinite cyclic group, you be we see the difference, and it's pure algebraic. It depends finite generating set on mid infinite. So I do now some examples where. So my idea is, I will show you a sequence series of examples, and the point is, it will be either NP complete or P, but the. The reason is geometric. You will see that it's about geometry. Yeah, something I'm a little unclear on is how, if these involve a Cayley graph, how is that presented to you? Cayley graph, yes, it's a good question. So, uh, of course, all these problems, uh, they make sense uh, when the good problem is decidable. Otherwise, you can immediately say these problems are not decidable at all. So if the good problem is decidable, it means given two words, you can say whether they're equal or not. You can efficiently construct this infinite graph. It means it's a procedure which goes and goes and goes and goes. <laughs> so and you know when to stop somehow. Uh, it's, it's infinite, so it doesn't stop. But but for you, what what you can do for every given n, you can construct the ball of radius n efficient. So you can do because it's infinite object, it, you, you you can stop. But what you know, you can construct any ball you want and high enough. And it's constructible in polynomial time? Uh, that depends on the group. I, I will get to it. Okay. That's a very good distinction, actually. It's a very good deep thing. So we will see soon. So right now, what I, I would like to, we can see it for z. Now I would like to have the direct sum of z of z, of the infinite cyclic group. So omega, it just, it means countably infinite direct sum. So it's infinite vectors where all components but finite remaining are zeros. So these are the standard the standard standard basis. E i it's uh, everywhere zeros one on the component i. So it's uh, infinite dimensional, so it's very countably many. And the 
this mine coordinate, so it's, these are generators of this group, it's infinite set of generators, and size of e EI, it's 4 plus 2 times 2 to time, 2 times size, so it's about, up to some constants, it's i. So the size of EI is i, next up and up and things. So I claim that the SSP subset some problem for this group is NP complete. Why? I can, t and this I use a lot of known NP complete problems from discrete optimization. This problem, so called zero one equation problem, is NP complete. It's not. So what the problem is? Given a zero one matrix, it means all components are either zero or one. Decide if there exists a zero one vector, all components of x are zero so one. Satisfy this equation. Y one n it's just vector where one 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 one. So it's not of the field of uh, two elements. It's just integers happen to be zero or ones. Since input for this problem is a matrix A, and the size is not, is not limited, so I can take arbitrary matrices. So this equation, basically, what, what does it mean? It's a linear combination of, of depends what you think about, say, columns of this matrix, linear combination. So you can immediately see that linear combination and x is 0 or 1, so coefficients are 0 or 1. So you can interpret SSP very quickly in this problem. And this is NP complete. So if I would solve SSP in this group, I would solve this one. But it's NP complete, so it's also NP complete. So Z, direct sum of Z countable is NP complete. So now this is, a, this is the thing. You, don't, you don't, don't read what is, just look at this. If you have G1 embeds into G2, G1 is a subgroup here. If I know that SSP for G1 is half, I can't expect that SSP for G2 is easy. Because if I'll take elements from, from the subgroup, linear co combination stays in this subgroup. So it doesn't go outside. So if for subgroup is half, for the group is half. The only thing is that embedding should be p-time computable. What does that mean, p-time computable? This is a group generated by some set of generators x1. This is by a2. This is a map. Elements here represented by words in x1. So if I give an a word, I should be able to compute its image phi of the word in p-time of the size of the word. That's, that means p-time computable. The only problem here is that if the finite generating sets are finite, it's always p-time computable. But if they're infinite, it depends. So that's a slight problem here. And it turns out that you can do quite a lot of things. For example, I don't know. These are metabillion groups. With abelian, it means they are built from abelian in two steps. They are sort of the easiest non-abelian groups. And this is very, very tame group, this product of Z. So what is this? OK, free metabelian, it's, it's a free object in the category, category of metabelian groups. What is good about it, if you take free metabelian group, This map gives an embedding of Z omega into the derived subgroups and commutators of free metabelian group. You take e vector EI and you map it to this element. Square brackets x2, x1, it's a commutator. It means x commutator, it means it's very, very, it's notation for very particular view. Commutator of x, y, it's uh, just x inverse, y inverse, x, y. So it's a word of length 4. So this is obviously polynomial time computable because it, it takes very, I don't know, 
almost being at time. It's being at time to write it down. So z in z omega embeds into this group. Since SSP is hot in the z omega, it cannot be easy in, in the bigger group. So primitive abelian group have NP complete SSP. And this is in unaries. That's a strange thing. All my words are in group theory, we represent them as unaries. So the word x to the 100 for group theorists is x, 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 x 100 times. We, we represent them really stupidly. So we give a lot of opportunities to, to do computations. The size of the element is huge, so we allowed a lot of steps to do. Still, it's NP complete. So it's very, very different from the classical one. In unities for classical SSP, polynomial time. Here it's not. And the group is not far from abelian. Really not far. So what about these products? The same thing, the same idea. These elements, they form a countable uh, direct sum of Z. So it's the same idea. So the famous Thompson group, that's a famous group which is occurred in logic and in group theory and a lot of research goes into it. So subset some problem for this group given by these two generators and these two relators is NP complete and the reason is that it's known that the risk product is embeddable. And I just showed that for risk products it's, it's hard. So it cannot be easy for F at least in NP half. And of course, it's a uh, good problem here in F. It's polynomial time decidable, so it's, uh, it's NP complete. This group was for the same reason. So I'm, I'm putting some famous groups for group theories, but we don't need to look at it. What interesting example, so what the, what the reason why it's why it's hard. The point is, the group is finitely generated, but it's not no theorem. There are, the, the whole group is finitely generated, but there are infinitely generated abelian subgroups. So there is no no theorem property that we got to use from community algebra. So you can interpret these binaries since it's infinitely generated subgroup, you can interpret binaries as I explained, two to them, the same thing. So that's one reason. Uh, the groups are not, some groups are not material. There are infinite vector spaces or free Z modules over there. Now, if you go here, it's absolutely different thing. You have bomb slug solitaire group that we discussed this morning, a little bit. It's metabelian, again, very, very simple relation. It basically says A times T is equal to, if I'll put T inverse, T inverse here, A times T is equal T to the times A to the P. If they always commute, just P. You have another exponent there. They're almost abelian groups, it's metabelian. But what, what it's interesting here, If you take cyclic subgroup generated by A, this is a group generated by A and T. Take a cyclic subgroup generated by A. And take Z with respect to that infinite set of generators that we discussed, for which we, we, we are getting binaries. This is infinite generating set which gives binaries for integers. And map it like that. I take A and conjugate by T to the N. So just product like that. T to the minus and A times T to the N. Of course, it's p-time computable because it's just length 2N plus 1. I can write it down in linear time. But what is, what is good, that goes from this relation. This element is actually equal to A to the 2 to the N. So what's going on here? It's a very, very interesting situation. That's why this group is actually famous. If you take subgroup A inside, every 
everything is generated by A. So this element, A times A times A, so on, 2 to the n times, inside the subgroup, it has length 2 to the n. So it's 2 to the n. It's like, like this integers. But using outside element T, I can write it much shorter. This element is equal to this one, though I, I'm using the letter T outside. It's like compression. And this length is 2n plus 1. So I have infinite cyclic sitting inside my bigger group, but it's distorted in terms of length. Length inside the subgroup is exponentially higher than length in the, in the group. So this allows me to take the subgroup is cyclic, so it's not about material property, but it's about the exponential distortion. So it's another effect of geometry. And it makes it, so looking at this element, for me it will be like standard classical SSP with respect to this set, which it means in binary, so it's in p-complete. So it's absolutely different effect going on here. I was talking about uh, metabelian groups. Now if you go to nilpotent groups, these are another type of groups constructed from abelian ones slightly different way, it's like unitriangular matrices. You take n by n matrices, zeros below the main diagonal, ones on the main diagonal, this is an important group. And many finely generated important groups sit inside this one as a sub, as sub. So if you take arbitrary finely generated virtually it means in this group, nilpotent subgroup is of finite, there is a nilpotent subgroup of finite index, so it's nilpotent groups and finite extension, little bit of, you can forget about it. But. Then subset sum, forget about this, subset sum as well as all these search and optimization problems are in P. They are not far from metabelian, they are, they, they, they are circuit from Abelian groups, but it turns out that everything is in P. And that's what precisely what you said. So if you construct the telegraph over there, the, the balls, the graph grows polynomial. So balls are of polynomial size, and you can construct them in polynomial time. So you can really go to this balls and see. It takes time to understand, but that's a main idea. It's absolutely different geometric uh, effect. The nilpotent groups, they grow polynomially. It's a famous result due to various people, but Gromov theorem shows that, yeah, so it's a good thing. Unfortunately, groups which grow polynomially are precisely virtually nilpotent, nothing else. It's a big class, but nothing outside. That's a famous Gromov theorem. Finely generated group, group grows polynomially if and only if it is virtually no pot. For them, everything is decidable because Kelly graph has this very, very slow growth. And there are opposite to them, so-called hyperbolic groups, the groups which grow really fast and it's, they, they really go outside very quickly. It's like free groups. And it turns out for these groups, all these problems are, are in pit time. So it's kind of strange. For, for abelian, we know it depends on unary binary. For metabelian, for many of them, it's NP doesn't matter, unary or binary. For nilpotent, it's NP, sorry, it's P, because they grow very slowly. Hyperbolic groups grow fast, exponentially fast unless they are trivial, somehow, like finite groups. Uh, but still it's in P, and it's absolutely different effect here. If I have, I don't know how many minutes I have. Uh, maybe two? No, no, five or ten. Okay, good, thank you. I, I, will, I will explain, it's a absolutely different geometry again. So the whole thing is about geometry, so it's, it's a different, different effect. And 
solving this problem, you can actually you see how to solve many other problems for hyperbolic groups. So I would like to solve subset some problem in the hyperbolic group G. I didn't say what is hyperbolic, hyper, hyperbolicity yet, but I, I will say a few words. So how one can do it? I would like to, to use uh, automata language, as Bob Gilman was talking about. So what does it mean? I would like to have some products of W1, W2, and WK. When we omit some of them, the product with emissions is equal to W. What does it mean? I either read W, or it's epsilon H. Epsilon it stands for the empty. It means just nothing read. I read W or do not read it, then either W2 or do not read. So all possible combinations are encoded here. W1, I read it, then I meet W2, maybe I meet W3, and so on, and then read WK. So it's one of the path here. It's only, and yeah, and it should be equal to WW. It means if I, that's technical. It means if I read W inverse, the, the whole thing will collapse to the empty view. It is true if I consider everything in a free group, because there, after cancellations, you, you see what's going on. In hyperbolic groups, and there's many other groups, the product of fields, <coughs> This product may not may not be equal to W as a viewer, but it's equal modular relations. And I didn't put relations anyway here. So that's a problem. In free group it's okay, but in the in, in, in the hyperbolic groups or other groups, I need to put relations. For example, W1 times W2 is not equal to W, but it's equal as element in the group. It means if I'll put some relations between, or at the end, or somewhere else, it will be equal after cancellation when we cancel x, x inverse. So I need to put relations here. So what, how, how do I do it? I have this graph, or any other graph, like final graph. At every vertex, I put all relations. So my group is given by x and set of relations. So I put all these relations here. So I can read W1 and then relation, and then another relation, and maybe this again. So I'm going along this graph, reading as many relations as I want, and then continue. So at every vertex, I put this bouquet of relations to make sure that I can read all of them. And then I do cancellation, pre-cancellation. I said I said I should cancel x, x, and inverse. So what I do if I if I see x, x, and inverse, I know that in any group it will be 1. So I put shortcut, epsilon h. I, instead of going x, x inverse, which is trivial, I go right here. So I do all possible shortcuts like that. And also shortcuts like x, epsilon, I put an h, x. So I do all possible cancellations, in other words. Oof. So what, what happened? I put all relations, and then I keep going, because I maybe I need a relation over here, I put again. So I do completion process. Starting from the graph I described, I put all relations, so maybe I should, I should draw it, because otherwise it's not clear what I'm going to Very easy. So I have uh, epsilon, w1, and so on, w inverse. So at every vertex, I put this all relations. And I've got a bigger graph. But I might be need, needing a relation over here, too. So I, I should do it again. So it's a second layer of relations, and so on. And then I do these shortcuts, epsilon. So if I did enough relations, I will see that product of wi is equal to ww. It means multiplying by w 
inverse, if I do cancellations, I will get an empty word. In other words, it means that if I did a lot of enough layers, I will see an edge labeled epsilon. So what's the algorithm? I do layer by layer, do shortcut, and see and wait until I will get this epsilon edge. If I got it, uh, I found that the answer is yes, and I can find the solution edge. The only problem, every layer gives me an exponent. The, the graph explodes exponentially. So it's not good. I would like to have it in, in P. I, I've got a nice algorithm, but it's exponential. But exponential is not very interesting because I can do brute force and check all the combinations. So what's the advantage? Advantage is that I, I didn't use hyperbolicity. So what's a hyperbolicity? You can typically hyperbolic spaces, oh, sorry, spaces hyperbolic. If you, if you have a triangle, it means three vertices connected by geodesic. They may not be unique, but if you have geodesic, it's, it's delta thin. It means if you fix arbitrary vertex here, there is another vertex on one of these sides, for example here, which has bounded distance from this one. That's a nice definition, standard one now, but it doesn't work here. So what, there is another less known definition of hyperbolicity, it concerns one camp and diver. If you have a word equal to, equal to one in the group, you can represent it geometrically. You, you do a loop on the plane, Euclidean plane, and consider two-dimensional complex. It means you divide it as a map, and you label every edge by letter such that here you read word U on the perimeter, and along any cell you read a relation. If and only if. Any word which is equal to one can be represented by such one camp and diagram. Hyperbolicity, that's true for arbitrary group. Hyperbolicity comes to comes here that from outside you can get to any face. And the number of steps you can go through the edge or through the uh, vertex. And the num number of steps is logarithm in the length of the perimeter. So what's going on? I have this word and another one, which is equal to, this is, say, my word, say, V, and another one, V1, V1 is equal to V. That what was going on here. How can I find V1? I do all this layers one by one. And then I will get it. How many layers I need to do? Logarithm. It's exponential in the logarithm, so it's polynomial. So that, that's a trick. I didn't explain it well, maybe. So this dual graph has logarithmic diameter ensures that I need just to do logarithmically many layers. So it's polynomial. So the graph actually grows polynomially, and that, this gives the solution. That's the graph you will get. But it's uh, still polynomial, because the number of steps, completions you have, it's just logarithm. And you can do optimization problem. It's, 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 it's again very interesting. In a group, you can have two points, and there are maybe exponentially many geodesics between them. So to find that u is between these two elements on one of the geodesics, it's not that easy, because there could be exponentially many geodesics with respect to the length of the total length of the points in the graph. But you can do so-called k fellow travel property of hyperbolic group. So there is a lot of geometry going into it. And uh, so what's the outcome? 
نعم So basically what, what I'm saying, <coughs> if you look at these prob problems in the classical form, you don't, you don't see this geometry inside. When you go to non-commutative, you can, you can see quite interesting effects. And of course, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that they can solve some, place, some application, go, for example, some factory and do, uh, I don't know, or bus company and do travel assessment problem better than they do. But I understand the complexity now that it's uh, of the uh, NP completeness of this much better. So, for example, a Euclidean has a uh, travel assessment problem. You can approximate by hyperbolic planes quite nicely. And in each one you can solve NP. You can, you can do, you can see a few things. That's one way, sort of looking back to discrete optimization problems. But what is really interesting, that these techniques, which are new to group theory, they are very useful in groups. For example, in hyperbolic groups, membership, subgroup membership problem could be undecidable. So there are finely generated subgroups said that for a given element, you can't decide whether it's inside the subgroup or not. What computer scientists do, they consider in this case bounded, whether this element is equal to product of generators of the subgroup and the number of factors is bounded. Of course, it's decided because they can do brute force. So without bounds, it's undecidable. I would, I expected that when you put bounds, it would be sort of growing complexity for each bound. But it turns out this, precisely this argument shows that bounded submanoid, not only subgroup, but submanoid problem is in P. Somehow there is a fixed polynomial bound. Doesn't matter. So it's, it's quite interesting. It's not, there are no such effects in, in the classical case. There is a famous result due to Gurevich and someone else about that if you not hyperbolic groups, if you consider matrices, you consider bounded submanoid, it can be complete on the, on the average. Not the worst case, but on the average. Means uh, on average it's very calm, not just very rare worst cases. But in here, in hyperbolic groups, it's, it's polynomial and it's, it's, it's fixed bound. So there are very, very strange things going on. And it's just uh, on EPSEC type problems. Anyway, thank you very much. Questions or comments? So do you get any insight into the distribution of typical instances that you just alluded to just a second ago? Or could you do things? Mm, that's a very good question, but no. Uh, I thought we will get this sub sub some annoyed bounded, like Gurevich case, because there are a lot of hyperbolic groups inside. But it turns out not. So you have matrices, there are hyperbolic groups inside. For each hyperbolic group, it's easy, sort of, for fixed one. But for matrices, it's uh, NP complete on average. So th we don't. Um, but uh, I think it's quite a lot of things that should be done, just initial steps. For example, uh, in group theory, on algebra, if you think, we represent elements in units. There's very, very few exceptions. For example, Paul Schupp and Gurevich recently considered modular groups where if you write x to 100, they didn't write x, 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 x 100 times. They said x in binary 100. So it's, it's a compressed form. And it turns out uh, in modular groups at least, or free groups, you still all problems are in P time. So you go to binaries, it's still in P time. But if you go to unaries in metabelian groups, not free groups or modular groups, but metabelian, in unaries it's in P complete. It's very interesting what will happen if you go to metabelian groups and compressed inputs. So it should be much harder than nobody knows what, what will happen. So 
I'm saying it's a different viewpoint uh, to al algorithmic group theory. Um, no need to consider everything in, in unaries. For example, if you're doing complexity, it's much better to do it in compressed form because you don't give too much time for attacker to solve attacker to solve the problem. The size is compressed. So, and uh, there is a lot of research in group-based cryptography and that people try to uh, design schemes using everything in units. And it's wrong because if you do RSA in units, it's, it's, it's easy. It's, it's just quadratic time. So, and we are trying in groups doing simulate hard problems, not simulating the essential part of it, compression. So it should be should be taken into account. I'm not saying that now it's clear we can we can have great crypto schemes. No, I'm I'm saying that it should be taken into account. Yeah. 